exploration both Keynes in economics. And there's a structure to the class. And you'll see that maybe some topics that I'll be discussing today, for example, or tomorrow, I won't discuss in great detail because I'll be discussing them later on in the week. Um, but feel free to ask questions if you have some. Um, don't be afraid to uh, raise your hand. You don't have to wait till the end. Uh, and I'll, uh, I'll uh, try to answer your questions the best I can. If I understand correctly, this ends at 530. So I propose to speak until about 3.30. We've lost 15 minutes. We try to make it up uh, until about 3.30. Then we'll have a discussion. If there is a discussion, a little break, and then pick up after. Um, I'm very proud to say that I wore a pink shirt in honor of a Barbie movie. Now, uh, which I saw. Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, so exploration in post Keynes and economics. I don't know. I'm assuming you're all familiar with post Keynes and economics. Okay. So um, that's good. There's no models in here. Um, I have done models with Mark Setterfield and. Sometimes I don't even understand. I'm out of paper now with VAR models, which I don't understand, but my co-author does. Uh, but this is just sort of a discussion. Um, there's a lengthy uh, introduction in case you don't know who I am. And um, uh, I'm going to go through that and talk about some projects that I am working on right now. So. My name is Louis Philippe Rochon. And it's not working. It's not working. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I am a full professor of economics at Laurentian University in Canada which is about four hours north of Toronto. I live in downtown Toronto. Um, I am currently the editor-in-chief of the Review of Political Economy. Um, ah, did it work? Yes. But can you, can I use this? No, I was able to do it before. Okay, so you're going. Yeah, perfect. I rolled it. You rolled it. Ah, I am the editor in chief of the Review of Political Economy, and I created the cover of the journal. I created the covers of all three. Journals. I'm very sort of a micromanager. <laughs> uh, I created the Review of Things in Economics eleven years ago, um, and that was. Uh, in response, well, when Edward Elgar approached me and wanted to know if I wanted to create a journal, I said yes. And the first person I reached out to was Matias Vernengo from Brazil, and we created this journal together. Which just uh, he's not, he's not from Brazil, he's, he's from Argentina, yeah. but he lived in Brazil, yeah, in Brazil for many years. Yeah. So, you know, the question, where are you from? Uh, okay, and uh, a new journal that I helped create, I didn't create it, but I helped create, I'm a consulting editor, it's Advances in Economics Education, also with Edward Elgar. Um, and this is a journal that explores um, topics of teaching. Um, and I'll be doing a, uh, a symposium in the journal on how to teach, what to teach, uh, post Keynes in heterodox economics, how to teach heterodox economics at the undergraduate level. Um, a lot of my focus in recent years has been on sort of developing material for undergraduates. I think there's a lot of books for graduate students, but very few for undergraduate. So I've been working on that. Well, 
roll the roll the leaf down. No. Oh, no. Oh, no. Usually at home when something doesn't work, I yeah. I hit it. Just one kind of You gotta get Danny back. There you go. Start to talk. Okay. No, go back. <laughs> it's a learning process. And this is a book series that I created with. Someone from Brazil called Silvio Capas. Uh, and we did it, uh, and Guillaume Vallet, a professor uh, in France, in Grenoble. It's a book series with very similar titles uh, Central Banking, Monetary Policy, and Something. And the books on income distribution, the environment, the future of money, uh, they've all come out. Uh, and uh, social responsibility and democracy has come out. Uh, COVID in Africa has now come out. Um, yeah, COVID in Africa. And this one as well uh, by um, uh, Ferrari and Lula. So, and, and Simone Deos is working on one on China. Uh, we got one on gender coming out. Uh, in 2024, financial stability, shadow banking is coming out. In 2024, monetary policy implementation is coming out. So uh, there's quite a lot. And there's one on um, bubbles, asset bubbles coming out. So um, quite a lot of, and the purpose of this series is just to push uh, the thinking over uh, central banks, the institution, of central banks, uh, monetary policy as well, and then various sort of elements that we think are um, related to that. And, you know, income distribution is becoming a very important uh, topic in monetary policy. The mainstream is sort of a, all of a sudden since the financial crisis realizing that monetary policy may have short-term uh, income distribution distributional effects. And so last year, so this, yeah, so we got that book. We had a conference in Toronto last year. We have another conference in November on this topic. We just had a, I just, we just co-organized a conference with the Bank of Italy. And I'll just tell you a little story, very conservative. And um, the the bankers at the Bank of Italy, they're coming, they're coming out with, you know, issues about monetary policy and personal income distribution uh, and short run effects, not long run because money is neutral in the long run, of course. And, and the conference, the workshop had half heterodox and half mainstream. And they're talking about that and they got VAR models and they got this and that. And here comes the heterodox and we say, oh, we got to talk about gender and they're going, what? And we got to talk about race and they're going, what? And we've got to talk about functional distribution of income, social classes, class conflict. And the chief economist from the Bank of Italy said, if you guys were working, you guys would never be working at the central bank here because we would not allow you to do this research. And it's sort of a, a very bold statement that he was making that shows, you know, the gravity of how the gulf between mainstream and, you know, these Venn diagrams where we seem to be taught. I don't even know if we even, I don't even know if we define income distribution the same way. They certainly don't talk about functional distribution. But for them, uh, functional uh, distribution of income is often measured in terms of consumption. Uh, uh, you know, anyways, it, it's, but it's, um, it, it was a, 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 a nigh awakening um, experience. I just edited the Encyclopedia of Post Keynes and Economics. It's already on Library Genesis. You didn't hear me say that, <laughs> but it's on Library. She's going, yep, it's on Library Genesis if you want. And I'm not, I think this book also is on Library Genesis. 
but you must buy a copy from Elgar and not go on Library Genesis. Uh, the introduction to macroeconomics. So this was, um, so the encyclopedia is sort of, a lot of it aimed at undergraduates. Uh, uh, do you have an entry in there? No? Uh, do you? Yeah, yeah, there you go. And, um, and the introduction to macroeconomics is really meant to be an undergraduate textbook. Um, and, you know, very sort of this topic is going to come back. Um, for example, you know, the first chapter, well, the chapter four, uh, you know, after the state of macro was a chapter, but the first real chapter of the book is on money. Because for macroeconomists, uh, you can't talk about investment in labor and growth and wages without an explanation of money. So to quote Sean Peter, money must be introduced at the floor on the floor at the at, at the floor of the of the of the analysis from the beginning of the analysis, right? So uh, macro dominates in that sense. It's very contrary to the mainstream, which is all about micro foundation. And in fact, there is no macro in a lot of mainstream because macro is simply an extension of micro. Some universities, um, NYU in New York is trying to get rid of macroeconomics. Uh, no need for it. So we take the very opposite sort of approach that analysis begins with macro. And if, if anything, uh, when we discuss micro, it's micro based on macro foundations. Institute, what we're talking at lunch, institutions, the proper context to analyze all of these micro elements must begin uh, from a proper analysis of macroeconomics. And that begins with banks and credit, central banks and other institutions. So, um, so this is sort of a few things uh, that I've done and I'm working on. And of course, since I'm a, a post-Keynesian, sorry, before I get that, um, and I, a year ago, started the monetary blog. Does anyone know? about the monetary blog? Okay, good, good. Uh, well, you know, we publish weekly, and believe me, it's a lot of work, weekly blogs on central. It's the only blog in the world dedicated to central banks from a critical perspective. And uh, um, I encourage you all to follow it. If you're interested on Twitter, that's the Twitter handle. And uh, we we bring you very critical blogs, and every so often we have a blog that goes viral. Have you heard about Mark Lavois's blog on profit inflation? It just exploded. It's a it's a blog from May this year in which he criticized Isabella Weber's uh, view on sellers' inflation, and uh, well, they're all friends now. We just had a conference in Rio together last week, and they posed for a picture. Uh, I'm trying to encourage them to write a blog together. Um, but um, yeah, so this is what we do at the monetary blog. And Professor here is going to, uh, at lunch, she, she wants to write a blog. And Jamie Galbraith writes regular blogs. And um, so if any of you have any ideas about blogs related to inflation, monetary policy, central banks, um, please reach out. I'd be happy to. Uh, to consider. And then, of course, because I'm a post Keynesian, my little dog, John Maynard Canines. Uh, <laughs> and I just put a picture of him in a raincoat today on Twitter. Um, so, uh, yeah. So uh, we call him Maynard because friends called him Maynard. Called him Maynard. Uh, and um, we want to adopt another dog, this one a female dog, and I want to call her Joan Violet Robinson. Okay. So this is a quote from Keynes that he gave at a BBC interview in 1942. It's not a very uh, known quote, but I think it's a quote that for me is uh, inspires me a lot. Keynes says, 
anything we can do, we can afford. Sort of a very sort of m and uh, uh, flavor to that. But in the long run, almost anything is possible. We can do almost anything we like given time. In good time, we can do it all. But we must work to a long-term program. And um, I use this quote to develop sort of a theory of full investment that Keynes mentions in the general theory. Not full employment, which he talks a lot about, but in one, one sentence, one place in the general theory, he talks about full investment. And this is sort of my influence and in how I marry these two sort of um, quotes together, which is, uh, so for me, you know, what's really missing, and, and I believe from, you know, from this quote, I believe anything is, has a solution. Poverty, unemployment, inequality, these all have easy solutions. But what's missing is the political will to do something about it. And when governments tell you we can't afford them, I uh, there's a, there was an election recently in, 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 in Ontario, and the candidate who was a minister of finance came. You know, they go door to door, and so I told him I was an economist, and, and he starts telling me, "Oh, we can't afford it." I said, "Yes, but you lowered." corporate taxes. Obviously, you can afford something. That's a lot of lost revenues. Oh, yes, we, we did that because it generates, it doesn't generate on the, uh, employment. But, you know, every decision from the, by the government is costly. When they decide to do, to lower taxes, et cetera, these are financial decisions uh, that they could decide to do something else, could decide to build social housing. But anyways, this is um, a quote, and there's another quote. If anyone has ever received an email, um, oh, it's not there because it's another quote later this week. But if you got an email from me where a quote came to the bottom of my email, is credit is the pavement along with production travel with bankers, and you, you know, their their job, they would you know extend credit to to up to the level of the public. Okay, so what I want to talk to you about today is the state of macroeconomics. So this is sort of setting up. Um, the argument for later, for, for right after this, for later in the week. And these are things that you're not surprised. You know, uh, macroeconomics, mainstream macroeconomics is in disarray. You know, it makes no sense. We know that. But, you know, I want to go through a couple of uh, 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 quotes and scenarios that show the extent to which it's in disarray. So Paul had this quote where he says, you know, there's a crisis in economic theory. The tight events of the last decade has diminished. And he wrote this around 2010. I should put the proper reference. The statute of economists of both neoclassical Keynesian and monetarist persuasions. Um, and he's right. And this is reminiscent of um, what John Robinson uh, spoke about in 1971, and I'll be speaking about that at the at the summer school next week, where she talks about the second crisis in economic theory. And Ian Robinson, whom I've never had the pleasure of meeting, but I have had her daughter lives not too far from me in Toronto, and I have had a lot of good discussions with her daughter, and et cetera. But Robinson, at the invitations of John Kenneth Galbraith, who was then president of the American Economic Association. Um, she was the first woman to give the Eli T. Richard talk in um, in New Orleans at the annual meeting in December 1971. Paper was published in 72. For the record, I'm going to be talking about that Tuesday a lot more because that's what started post-Keynesian economics. It, it all began with that meeting. Um, but she spoke in, in New Orleans about the second crisis. And for her, the first crisis was obviously the Great Depression and the inability of mainstream economics to account for unemployment. Um, her second sort of uh, crisis, when she spoke about it in 71, was the inability of, call it what you want, bastard Keynesianism, new, uh, uh, free Keynesian theory, 
pre Keynesian pre Keynesian theory after Keynes, call it what you want, um, neoclassical synthesis, well, its inability to account for income distribution or for um, just generally uh, the real world, poverty, and et cetera. And you know, in a way, it's a, it's a shame that that talk was not given today because Joan Robinson would have a lot to say about the third crisis in economic theory, which is what I'll be talking about next week. And the third crisis is really, is really a poly crisis. We have multiple overlapping crises. And again, it's about the inability of mainstream economics to explain these crises and to find solutions. Now, this is not surprising. Mainstream economics, neoclassical economics, Keynesian economics, not posting, Keynesian economics, these models are about convergence and stability. So, of course, these models cannot explain the crisis. They can only explain recessions provided you have imperfections. Sticky prices, sticky wages, imperfect uh, uh, expectations, etc. You need imperfections. You need to introduce some sort of exogeneity in the model because, on its own, the model converges to equilibrium. And the equilibrium is stable. Unlike Minsky, who says he doesn't say equilibrium or destabilizing, but you know, stability creates instability. Here, Stability creates stability. And once you're in equilibrium, you have absolutely no reason to leave your equilibrium position. And what you require is a shock, is a black swan. And that's how you explain, oh, and but, but, but black swans or exogenous shocks are a way of washing your hands of, of, of what's happening around you. Oh, it's not our fault. Uh, it's a black swan. We had absolutely no. Whereas, if you take more of a complexity approach, you realize that everything is interrelated. COVID was not a black swan. If you Google COVID black swan, you've got hundreds of pages that explain why COVID was a, you know, when you destroy the environment, something's going to happen. And then, you know, if you deregulate banks and they start lending to subprime clients, something's going to happen. And so the financial crisis, the idea that the financial crisis was not related by, to bad bank behavior is completely ridiculous. Something's happening. It's okay. And uh, I'm used to people talking behind me. <laughs> 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 um, yeah. For the mainstream, convergence and stability. So, oh, sorry about that. But someone is trying to. Mas as pessoas não aparecem. Eu vou continuar com a apresentação enquanto eles tiram. Eu acho que podemos conseguir algumas coisas. Convergence and, st and, and stability. And this is nothing new for us. Many people for decades have been talking about how inadequate uh, mainstream theory is. And, you know, I'm not going to dwell too much on that. But what I want to do what, is to bring out some of the quotes and some of the. Um, is it good? No? I continue here? Yes, you continue here. Sorry. Um, uh, so I, I want to uh, talk about some of the quotes 
and we say in French, le cheminement, um, uh, how they got there. And it's really quite extraordinary. And, you know, I think that the ultimate example of this disarray, of this disconnected uh, mainstream view is recently when Lawrence Summers was somewhere in the Caribbean. Did you see that picture? He's in the Caribbean in a big comfortable chair, palm trees, the ocean in the back saying, we need more unemployment. And uh, I think these people need to be tense. I think they're irrelevant to the discussion. And I was, I gave a paper in February at the United Nations and uh, uh, it was me and it was uh, Jose Antonio Campo. And, and I, I said this, I said, he needs to be canceled and it's irrelevant. Okay, I just went like that. And, uh, and I turned to him and he said, well, what do you want me to say? This guy's calling for more unemployment to reduce inflation. It's bad theory and it's complete. So it's okay to create unemployment and unemployment leads to people losing their houses, divorce. So this is acceptable, you know? And a couple said, well, oh, no, we gotta do what we gotta do. And I said, well, how about tax and profits? How about, you know, identify, anyways. I'll have something to say on Friday about that because I'm, I'm gonna give that presentation. Here in Brazil, people, mainstream economists are saying like that the non rate, inflation rate of unemployment is around 10% of unemployment. It's a good rate. <laughs> And that's your center of gravitation. Yeah. Okay. So, and what's current unemployment? It's eight percent. It's too low. Increase unemployment to ten. <laughs> yeah. Raise interest rates even more. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, and and and, and I want to say the degree to which there's tension between amongst the mainstream. So, amongst, um, you know, there was always uh, tension between the salt water and um, the freshwater economists um, before the crisis, between your real business cycles and your new Keynesian economists and your post-Keynesian economists against everyone. So there was always tension amongst these, these schools, but I think that the tension, the, starting with the financial crisis, starting again with COVID, showed to which degree these tensions have reached um, an incredible height. Um, but they do agree on one thing, that in the long run, like I said, whether you're Keynesian, Keynesians are just neoclassical economists with imperfections. So in the long run, you go back to, to, to full employment and everything's okay. Um, So I had a quote by Krugman, but I'm not going to waste time. Um, so the story begins uh, with the great moderation. Um, this period of about 20, 25 years of relative stability and calm, um, low inflation, uh, low uh, volatility in real GDP growth, what Krugman called the golden era of the profession. Um, and there was this sort of general agreement that um, everything was okay, that economists, economics had reached the stature of scientific, uh, 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 scientific stature. Um, uh, Lucas, in his presidential address, uh, same address that John Robinson gave in 71, but in 2003, 2002, published in 2003, said macroeconomics in this original sense has succeeded, hooray. Um, its central problem of depression prevention has been solved. You see that, macro, is it okay? Macroeconomics has been solved. The problems of macro has been solved. No. Oh. 
The problems of macro has been solved. He says, for all practical purposes, and has in fact solved from, been solved for many decades. So it's not only the great moderation, maybe a little bit before, um, the potential for welfare gains from better long run supply side policies exceeds by far the potential from further improvement in short run Keynesian demand management. Good. Back to here. Thank you. There you go. That's the quote by, by Lucas. Um, now, you know, the story about Lucas and his wife. In divorce, well, Lucas was about rational expectations. And when he got divorced, his wife put in the divorce agreement that if he won the Nobel Prize within 10 years, he would have to give her half. And he won the Nobel Prize on the 10th year. So the big joke is she's the one who had rational expectations. <laughs> Uh, then at the International Monetary Fund, right, the state of macro, there's a broad convergence of opinion or vision. So there's this thing about economists were united in this idea that macro succeeded. And let's be clear, it's macro based on micro foundation that, there you go, it solved everything. Um, and there was this ideological detente. Um, everything was fine, as a quote from Blanchard. The state of macro is good. Macroeconomics are going through a period of great progress and excitement. And this is 2008. I wonder what happened that year. I, 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 <laughs> my memory is a bit blurry. Um, now, uh, uh, there's some papers who have said, well, the great moderation is attribu attributable to good economic policies, good economic theory, and of course the policies from the models. But others have said that it's ma mainly good luck. It's a sheer luck. We're just been lucky that, you know, we've been, uh, uh, we've had these this moderation. And it brings up the questions from the post Keynesian policies. How did we get from a, how do, how can post Keynesians explain the great moderation? If that period was, from our perspective, full of bad policies and bad models. And that's a question that we need to, uh, I don't think I've seen anything on that question. Um, if anyone has a good uh, idea uh, on how, but I think that would make a very good paper. That's a paper I would be very interested in publishing. But nevertheless, um, the great moderation can be uh, uh, um, um, summarized by two arguments. Monetary policy dominance, the idea that fiscal policy is bad, that the only policy worth pursuing the only policy is monetary policy only monetary policy can solve problems fiscal policy can only lead to more problems hence the need for fiscal austerity balance your budgets and let central banks do the rest and hence the reason why you need independent central banks. I'm uh, giving a paper in, in September <laughs> on independence of central banks at a conference in honor <laughs> of uh, um, his name. <laughs> the guy who wrote the paper about debt ceilings, Harvard guy. Yeah. Well, if public debt, uh, Hogarth, the conference in honor of Hogarth, and uh, so I'm going to be very critical, of course. 
But yeah, so independence of central bank is the core principle, and that allows central banks to be independent, pursue the proper policies, and we see what that means today. John Smith and I just published a blog last week on the revenge of the rentier, which is what we're seeing now. John wrote a book in 1996, subtitled The Revenge of the Rentier. And, uh, uh, you know, this is a, a view of monetary policy based on social classes, which is completely uh, different than how the mainstream views central banks and monetary policy. But monetary policy dominant. And the other one, micro foundations, which is, you know, can be seen in every sort of dynamic stochastic models of general equilibrium. Okay, so uh, I think in the in, in the reading list there's a paper by Service Store, an INET paper based on bad models in the SG models. Okay, it's, it's a very good paper, and you know basically it means you know um, it's 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 the only game in town. I gave a paper at the Bank of England on monetary policy and income distribution. Bank of England where they speak English. And at the end of the my talk, someone told me, um, we don't understand what you're saying. Where's your DSG model? And I go, what do you mean you don't understand? It's in English. And it, to the point where they don't understand if you don't have a DSG model. I'm not technical, but... Um, But it's, it's the language of economics now, and we have to find a way of, and that's why I think sort of, uh, how many of you do VAR models and those advanced techniques? How many of you do stock flow modeling? How many of you do econometrics? Okay, because at the Bank of England, at the bank at the Bank of England, what was surprising is my co-author presented the VAR model that I told you about. It was very interesting because all those uh, uh, IMF people or um, uh, World Bank people that were there, they understood and they asked questions and they understood the model. And the other non-model uh, mo uh, papers, no, they just didn't understand. And uh, and it's it's so I encourage a lot of we were talking about that. I encourage a lot of young people to do these models, but you have to be able to also provide good theory and good context for it. Um, because you have to be, because those papers with good theory, good explanation of institutions and markets with these VAR models or any other sort of technique, you'll be, now you're able to talk to both groups. You can go to a mainstream conference and then they'll understand your model. They may not like it, but they'll understand it. You'll get questions. And you can go to a heterodox and they'll understand, you know, your, your, the non-technical part of the paper as well. Okay, so those two. Uh, monetary policy dominance. Uh, I wrote a few papers with Mark Setterfield about this in the JPKE and in the IGPE. And I'm going to come back to that, uh, I think, Wednesday. So I'm not going to talk much about this, but it is the idea that uh, fiscal policy, you know, lead to crowding out, uh, crowding out effects and inflationary and uh, et cetera, and that you need to reduce the size of this. I think, I think that um, austerity fiscal policy, really what's behind that is the reduction of the state. You know, this is the, the, the argument that they cannot accept that the state has some sort of social, call it, call it what you want, uh, role to play. So you need to reduce the state and leave room for markets. Um, and then Alan Blanger wrote, even just in 2004, virtually every contemporary discussion of stabilization policy by economists is about monetary policy, not fiscal policy. And so fiscal policy sort of disappeared from the language of economists. Um, and this quote by Quiggin says essentially uh, the same thing. 
Um, and, you know, here he says that the great moderation was the result of monetary policy dominance, this mainstream framework. Uh, a quote by Randy and, and Stephanie, where, you know, this is sort of a, a move away from Keynesian policy. Okay. But we knew this. We knew this was the death of whatever Keynesian flavor you want to talk about. It was all about micro foundations and these models. Um, and the emphasis on VSG models got really sort of uh, uh, um, violent. There was a book uh, in France published by Cahun and Zilberbert called Le Negationisme, Le Negationisme Economique, Economic Negationism. And where they argue that anyone who does not do... Now, in France, there's been this severe uh, uh, attack on the heterodox economists. And they were saying that anyone who does not do a DSG model should not be hired, should not be teaching in economic departments. And there was this, this attempt to purge heterodox from, main, from, from economics departments. And uh, and so you can see the ideological sort of um, sort of flavor. And and here's a quote by 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 Mankiw, sorry by Lucas, and I'm sure you've seen it. Is one cannot find a good under forty economists who identify themselves as Keynesians today. And this was before the crisis, and you'll see how things change after the crisis. Real scientists, after all, do not leave to Newton's Principia Mathematica to solve contemporary problems in physics. So the idea here is that we don't... I remember once being told when, um, when I submitted a paper to a mainstream journal. Don't do that. It's not worth it. Mm -hmm. But the review was saying this, you know, you should not quote anything that was published more than five years ago. So the idea here is, you know, we don't go through the, we don't read through the general theory to solve problems today. This is essentially what this quote is about. And in fact, of the 7,000 papers published by the NBER between 85 and 2000, only five mentioned fiscal policy. Okay. So this is the extent of how fiscal policy sort of disappears some of the profession. So everything was great. Everything was thought to be perfect until, of course, you had uh, the financial crisis in 2007 and 2008. And then even then, there was a reluctance to embrace fiscal policy. Fiscal policy was sort of um, adopted reluctantly in 2009. And this is what there were lots of hopes that this was the return of the master, uh, to quote Skidelsky's book. Um, and whereas Krugman had called the great moderation uh, the golden era of the profession, he now talked about the crisis as being the dark age of macroeconomics. Okay, but fiscal policy was a bleep. By, two, it was, by 2010, a year later, at the Toronto uh, G20 conference, it was agreed that government should stop using fiscal policy. And so only a year later, there was no return of the master whatsoever. And uh, uh, there was uh, a return to austerity. But um, there was a the beginning of what I called in, in a paper, the civil war in, in mainstream macroeconomics. You had your RBC, your real business cycles against your, your new Keynesian economists, and they were pointing fingers. And the great war started. Uh, at first came denial. You deny a crisis even exists. Um, in 2005, um, shortly before, you know, Ben Bernanke 
was arguing that everything was fine. Eugene Pham in 2007, everything was fine. In 2007, uh, Bernanke in front of Congress says, we are not anticipating anything, everything in fine. In January 2008, and don't forget, the interbank market in Europe had started to freeze in 2007. So there were huge signs. Yet in 2008, uh, Bernanke was saying, no, 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 everything is fine. So you deny, you deny anything. And of course that makes sense, because if a central banker comes out and says, oh no, we're in trouble. I'm sure the consequences would be very great. So maybe you're, you're meant to deny everything publicly. But there were some people who were uh, arguing that something was happening. Um, and you know, of course, um, uh, uh, who was that guy that was nicknamed Dr. Doom? Um, this economist from NYU. For for three years before, the, from 2004 up to 2000, he was saying a crisis is coming, a crisis is coming. Dean Baker from EPI was saying, the, uh, uh, Hubini, Nouriel Hubini, Dean Baker was saying the same thing. The financial, you know, this housing bubble you know, it can't be, it's unsustainable. And when it bursts, we're going to have a recession. And there were some people who, who were already picking up on subprime uh, loans growing. And by definition, subprime loans are, well, subprime. And so this idea that, um, so you deny. You accuse those who are calling for, you know, Summers, oh, that guy again, called um, uh, those who were expecting a crisis misguided and ludites, you know. Um, so you deny and you accuse them of being stupid. And of course, we know the Queen. And what was really interesting is uh, the response to the Queen's comments. Um, I'm kind of young here. So in 2009, the Queen asked a bunch of economists in Britain, why couldn't you see this crisis coming? And we know why, because the models cannot predict. Those models cannot entertain the idea of a crisis. It's about convergence and stability, not instability and fragility, which is what Paul Keynesians are about. But what was really sort of um, but that was the official response by economists, yeah, yeah, mia culpa. But the real sort of, I think, um, proper response came from Thomas Sargent, who, who you know, accused the, the queen of being ignorant an intentional disregard of what modern macroeconomics is about. Imagine that. We're in full-fledged crisis mode. The queen raises concern, and she's being accused of being ignorant about macroeconomics. And what that quote shows for me is Tom, Sar is Tom Sargent's ignorance about his own models. It's really quite stunning. You know, I mean, this is sort of flat earth theory. And this idea that if you show me proof that the earth is round, that's fake news. Mm -hmm. But this is what these people operate. Now, once you deny everything and you go into the second mode of so at first, I, I was trying to write a paper on the five stages in psychology where they call about the five stages of acceptance. When you're sick, you go through denial, then fear, then finally acceptance. I couldn't, I didn't quite get there, but anyways. Uh, so maybe this is not fear, but it, it was certainly this idea that no, no, no. The theory had nothing to do with it. Again, flat earth. Um, Blanchard, 
who I think has evolved a little bit, but the crisis was not triggered primarily by macroeconomic models. In a, in a policy or models, in many ways, the general policy framework should remain the same. So we should continue having fiscal austerity and monetary policy dominance. Um, and then there were a lot of people who were saying that. Then comes finger pointing. This is uh, really the most beautiful part uh, of what was going on. Um, some people were calling DSG models aesthetically beautiful but mad. Krugman, the economics profession, mistook beauty clad in impressive looking mathematics for truth. The dysfunctional, and you know, that's great of Krugman, but in a in a paper in the what is it called? Oxford Journal of Political Economy. They had a two-issue dedicated to uh uh, dynamic stochastic models. And, you know, he says the same thing, but he's not calling for a rejection of these models, but, you know, for the coexistence of different models. But nevertheless, uh, it was a, a, a mad theory. The dysfunctional driver of evolutionary progress in UK economics has been the internal theoretical standards of the academic profession rather than a concern to understand how the macroeconomy works. The result has increasingly been macro models of great complexity that bear little relation to reality. Stiglitz, uh, who was essentially fired as chief economist because he once said that the World Bank was dominated by just bottom graduating economists from top universities. I believe that most of the core constituents of the SG model are flawed, sufficiently badly flawed that they do not cry provide even a good starting point. Uh, Brad, DSG macro has proven a degeneration, degenerating research program uh, and a catastrophic failure. 30 years of work have produced no tools for useful forecasting of policy analysis or relevance. For more than three decades, macroeconomics has gone backwards. Uh, and you would assume that after such condemnation, would come some sort of internal introspection. Sorry. And, you know, I go to the Eastern Economic Association every year. And in 2007, 2008, 2009, thousands of mainstream models on the crisis. 2010 onwards, nothing. <clears throat> nothing. And or papers related to mm, rethinking, mainstream, you know, nothing. It was just business as usual. And I'll admit that in a few slides. Making ancient and basic analytical errors all over the place. Paul Krugman uh, accused Barrow of making truly boneheaded arguments. Krugman at his um, Lionel Robbins lecture in the last three decades or so, most macroeconomics was spectacularly useless at best and positively harmful at worst. But what's really ironic here is that Krugman is part of that mainstream. You know, so trying to make sense of who they have, you know, they see themselves as sufficiently different from the mainstream. I'm not a real business cycle uh, economist, economist, so therefore I must be. And then this, of course, this Boiter uh, uh, quote that's so often used, and I love it. The typical graduate macroeconomics and monetary economics training received at Anglo-American universities during the past 30 years may have set back by decades serious investigations. By decades, I think he's referring to the general theory. I don't know but I'm guessing, serious investigations of aggregate economic behavior and economic policy relevant to understanding. It was, private, it was a privately and socially costly waste of time and resources. Stiglitz, America's graduate school bears testimony to a triumph of ideology over science. And that's a repeat of 
So it's quite, quite stunning um, what they were saying. And then Bob Solo said, you know, just critical of DSG models. They don't pass the smell test. And I believe that coming from Solo, actually. Um, Solo is, you know, it was just granted that the whole economy can be thought about as a single consistent person, right? These micro foundations. But anyways, um, great quote by Solo. And the criticism is not new. Back in 1991, graduate programs in economics may be turning out a generation with too many idiot savants. And this is what Stiglitz said about the economists who were, who were basically hired at the World Bank and IMF. They were idiot savants, skilled in technique, but in, innocent of real economic issues. And I have to say that I'm seeing a little bit of that now, even in heterodox economics where these really technical stock flow and other techniques have taken over where theory uh, is a bit lacking. So if you're doing these technical play papers, please pay attention to the theory and to the, um, the theory. Okay. And despite what Barshaw said in 2016, I don't see that yet. I don't see that yet because essentially, I don't think there's anything out there to replace the DSG model. Um, I know post Keynes have stock flow ideas. Stock flow models are being adopted in some government departments, and that's very interesting, but for the record, stock flow models were uh, used by mainstream economists at one time, right? It, the, is what makes st stock flow modeling is not a heterodox methodology. Now, what you put in your model is heterodox. How you build your model is heterodox. But stock flow is not per, uh, is not per se heterodox. And so I think that when Lavoie and Godley sort of developed uh, Godly first and Lavoie helped to make these stock flow. And now everyone's doing stock flow in heterodox economics. I, I think they were hoping that it would sort of convince the mainstream, uh, but it hasn't so far. Uh, just more stuff, more stuff. Well, there was some sort of maybe some mea culpa going on, uh, but in my opinion, not uh, not so much um, as it warrants. Um, but even today, um, real reality is not an important feature of these models, and the crisis has has passed. And as I said, it's history. No one talks about it anymore. And that's why I sort of wanted to talk about it today from this institutional, you know, uh, profession, professional perspective, because I think that there's still much to learn and that the profession has largely gone back to business as usual. And I'm teaching now, my undergraduate students are 20, 21 years old. They don't know about the crisis. They were fifth. They were five years old at the time. And when I talked to them about, you know, talking to them about the crisis, it's like talking to them about floppy disks. You know, um, it's something. Have some. And so I think that we need to continue. You know, let's not get obsessed with it, but we need to continue talking about this crisis because you see that when there's another crisis and. You know, for the record, capitalism has evolved into a system of crises. Look at the history of crises. There was one in 33 AD, the first recorded financial crisis, the result of um, a crisis in bank lending, and however you want, anyways, yeah. And then, you know, they were like 500 years, 600 years apart. And starting in the 19th century, they started becoming three or four per century, then per decade, 
and now it's three or four per per, de per decade. So that that's the evolution of of capitalism that we've sort of gone from a system of relative stability to a system of constant crises and today of of poly crises. And so the question is, how do we solve these? And if, and this is a third crisis in economic theory, if mainstream theory is unable because it's still stuck in these D DSG models, micro foundations, monetary policy dominance, inflation comes back, and the first gut reaction is to go back to this model of only interest rates. And we know interest rates don't, don't solve inflation. We know that. So, but they're still being used because it's the only game in town. So uh, we have to start talking about them again. And so, you know, there's been, so yeah, it's all these models. So maybe they're tweaking these models a little bit. Um, Farmer has sort of come out and rejected the natural rate of interest, but that's one guy. Uh, but these are all post-Keynesian ideas, right? The number of papers now in mainstream that sort of take a look at some ideas in post-Keynesian economics without attributing them to us, by the way. Have you seen the debate between Blanchard and myself on Twitter about conflict inflation? And I told him, come on, post-Keynesian has been talking about that. He has been talking about that for a long time, but based on Rothorn paper, I said, come on, you can at least say, oh, yeah. and he did. He wrote on Twitter, yeah, I recognize the post Keynesians have been talking about this for, for a long time. But generally, there's been no recognition. Um, Paul Romer's latest attacks in the profession never mentions Caldor's work on the growth, Danny Roderick's um, technical change, uh, Bank of England questions money multiplier model. I published a paper in Rope, que the money multiplier is dead by Fed researchers. Rope published a paper by Rudd, I was gonna say Paul Rudd, but that's the wrong Rudd, um, on expectations having no role on inflation, but there's still no, you know, we're still not getting our new. And as much as we try to, you know, whenever I see a heterodox paper on income distribution, I send it to all my mainstream contacts who do work on that, mm. on monetary policy and income distribution. I'm hoping that maybe they'll quote one or two papers or something. Um, but anyways, um, and so this is sort of, and then the, the, the COVID also, after the crisis, that seemed to be maybe in a little bit of the top, but COVID also brought that back. And I think there was much more of a return of the master during COVID, certainly in Canada. But you know, in Canada, we nationalized the, the labor market. Uh, we've nationalized the labor market. We gave $2,000 a month to every worker, every person in Canada, regardless of their job status. So, um, and I know in many countries as well. But COVID is going to fade. And then it's going to be sort of a return to the uh, business as usual as well. Um, so this sort of, you know, regardless of this feuding amongst the mainstream components of the profession, as I said, these are essentially the same theories. Um, and we know it's in disarray. We know that the use of monetary policy to fight inflation is wrong. And yet we see inflation coming down and said, we see inflation coming down because of, you know, the fall in oil or uh, the fall in bottlenecks or the fall in cost of transporting, transporting goods. So inflation, by the way, remember a year ago when central bankers said, we're not going to raise interest rates because inflation is going to be temporary. Guess what? They were right. They only started raising interest rates because they were accused of being um, negligent. And so in order to 
satisfy the concerns of finance, they started raising interest rates. Um, Jerry Epstein says central banks perform monetary policy through the lens of through uh, lens finance finance colored lenses, and I think that's very right. Yet we see central banks saying, "See, our policies are working because of us that inflation is coming down." And now you know when when we say, "Okay, well then start then bring down interest rates." No, we can't because now we're afraid of a wage price spiral. The same thing. Yeah, of course, because you blame the workers. You always blame the workers. Inflation is fought on the backs of workers. And everybody thinks I talk to people in my neighborhood who are educated people. But not economists. And they tell me, yeah, yeah, no, 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 we have to. Great unemployment. That's how we bring down inflation. Right. And I know we have to keep interest rates. I know it's painful, but you know, we're told that this is how it works. You know, you try to explain how it works. I read, you know, I you know how much time I spend emailing reporters. Like this guy, the Wall Street Journal, I'm gonna email him. And you know, send them, you know, hey, why don't you look at these economists? They have a different view. Uh, I was telling Red Lunch that I was at a party and I said to this reporter, I said, you should interview me on inflation. He goes, yeah, but you don't work for a bank. Mm -hmm. So I was not a legitimate source, even though I got a PhD in economics, I'm a professor. I'm, yeah, I'm not sure if you're, I'm not sure if you're credible on this. Again, the same thing. So we got a lot of work to do. This said, I think that we got to continue our work and continue developing post Keynesian because there is, I think, a great need for this alternative. We know the mainstream are only preoccupied in accusing each other and then sort of agreeing on how great our theories are. You have a couple of bright lights who point out the weaknesses. But it's up to us to double down and continue our research. And hopefully, and, you know, do email reporters, do email scholars and send them copies of your work. You never know, maybe there'll be a spark, maybe there'll be an interest or something. But I think that we, you know, we tend to do research and we don't, and then I know there's a lot of debate, which I'll deal with, about how do we interact with the mainstream. Lavoie and Lee wrote, uh, edited a book on that and a symposium in, in my journal years ago. But I think we need to do a little bit more of that. Anyways, um, that's it. And I know that Aoi, I wanted to go until 3, but we started late. I had kind of scheduled it for 90 minutes. Good. So are there any questions? <laughs>